Okay, so apart from the fact that I've shaved, I actually, um, while I was working today, I was listening to a uh, philosophy podcast, and I was, I was learning about somebody's critiques on the Enlightenment era, you know, Enlightenment-style thinking, which, you know, brings about getting rid of, you know, thousand, thousands of years of religious dom- dogma, as they call it, to, you know, use that religious dogma to go about discovering and, and not necessarily discovering but claiming to know the truth of life right we've used that as the framework by which we you know do anything basically that's the way that it used to be before the enlightenment you know you say you know we're going to focus more on the individual we're going to try to find truth and and reality through reason and and logic and all of these other things like science because it's better right whatever but even science has its limits that's the one thing that i learned is you know it's not the end all be all otherwise you 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 take science just like dogma and it'd be very easy to do so because we have sort of a drive to look at it in that way we have a drive to have a dogma that's what's kind of inherent about us humans is that we want a dogma in a sense almost because it simplifies things you know we can just say okay we figure science is the end all be all we got it we figured out we got scientists in lab coats. They're the ones that are going to figure out the truth about life. I can sleep in peace knowing that the truth about life, the real truth, is being discovered. And I can study it and find out for myself if I want to. But it's not necessarily the truth or the only truth. It's truth within a the paradigms of the culture that you're born into and the society and what questions you're even going to deem important. <clears throat> And worth doing psychological procedures, not psycho scientific procedures. It's all that kind of stuff, you know. Like even science has its limits, but it's a very useful to it. It doesn't take away from its utility and how useful it's been to us. So let's see how useful this video can be, as well, right? How to stop wasting your life, Carl Jung as a therapist. Let's go. What else needs to be said? I don't know. It's a twelve minute. It's a thirteen minute video technically, but. This is, I think, the first Academy of Ideas. I'm going to try to talk, you know, like, not make it boring. It's, it's a little bit of more of a slow-paced video. Learn more about our membership. Not talk too much, though. And the art we use in the videos by visiting academyofideas.com. Okay, let me turn that This is precisely bit. the risk a modern man runs. Okay. He may wake oh up God. one day to find that he has missed God, half his life. Psychotropic drugs have become one of the most common forms of half his life. Psychotropic cup one day to find the risk that he modern has man runs. He may wake up one day to find out he has missed half his life. Ooh. Missed half his life. A lot of people do wake up like that. Psychotropic drugs have become one of the most common forms of treatment for anxiety disorders and depression. But these drugs are not very good at curing people, and often they just become crutches for lifelong psychological cripples. Fortunately, there are alternative ways to treat anxiety and depression. This is true. My In brother video, has. We are going to turn anxiety. to Carl Jung, one of history's greatest psychiatrists for drug-free advice on how to find a cure to these psychological disorders. The elite, wrote Okay, Jung, that's good. Still cling because, you know, firmly to the I'm kind of anti-drug around here, you know? Not really. <laughs> but I just don't... I, I, whenever people get prescribed drugs, I'm like, let that be the last thing that you have to do. Try everything else first. Okay, because it's run like a business model. They're not there to cure you. They're there to keep you coming back. And keep you, I don't know, I've seen exceptions. I've seen people like not hand out shit because they don't want you to get addicted they don't want you they think it's maybe not healthy for you to take too much you know but they're still working under a business model like they're supposed to keep like it's not it's not also that it's just like it's not necessarily that they just designed it i don't think so to like keep you hooked in and keep you coming back i think that's just sort of the limitations of what we have you know, it's also, it's it's probably both. You know, it's also the limitations, how we can't just cure something with a drug completely. But also the fact that it's being run like a business model. So I wouldn't want people to get too hooked up on, you know, antidepressants. They antidepress you until you're depressed again. And then you depend on the pills that are supposed to make you independent. Uh, so, you know, I'm not the biggest drug guy. But let's let's see. Carl Jung is, gonna, is here to save the day. So we're okay. That anxiety disorders originate in alterations within the brain. Unfortunately, many run-of-the-mill doctors still swear by this gospel to the detriment of their patients, whom our age produces in swarms. Nearly all these patients have been convinced by the medical dogma that their sickness is of a physical nature. Mm. 
Jung believed that most cases of anxiety and depression are not the product of a faulty brain, but of a faulty way of life. That is the first a very step in Jung's way of method of thinking. treatment, therefore, yes. was not a drug prescription, but a dose of psychological insight. Insight okay. regarding what to expect from life, and insight into what it takes to change. Mm. With respect to the former, Jung noted that many people believe that life should be easy, suffering kept to a minimum and difficulties avoided. But Jung would be blunt with his patients, telling them that life is not easy, and comfort and it peace are not our natural state. Nope. Or as Jung wrote, In the last resort, it is highly improbable that there could ever be a therapy that got rid of all difficulties. Man needs difficulty. They are necessary for health. What concerns us That's here is only true. an excessive amount of them. That's the close the way. Accepting that difficulties are inevitable, and nothing worth achieving comes easy, places us on the firm ground of reality from which to change. For when we accept that a life is hard, we will also realize that only through a strengthened character do we have any chance of living a good life. If, on the other hand, we remain... Reminds me of the John F. Kennedy quote from Call of Duty. He said, well, I don't think it's... I don't know if he said that in real life. I doubt he said it. I, I, I doubt he only said it in the game. I'm pretty sure it's real life, too. At least I hope so. But he says, don't pray for easy lives, gentlemen. Pray to be stronger men. Okay, that's the just of that also jim ron says it all the time don't don't wish it was easier wish you were better don't wish for less difficulties wish for more skills it's all really a change in that right that's what he's talking about right now the, the psychological insight and caught in the delusion that life should be easy we will be less motivated to overcome a weak character as we will falsely hope that if we just give it time life will get easier huh. life is a battleground wrote jung it always has been and always will be and if it were not so, existence would come to an end. There is another piece of psychological insight that Jung saw as crucial for his patients to understand. Namely, that our problems exist in the present, and that present problems are not solved by digging into our past. Many people like to believe that only when they have determined why they are the way they are, can they move forward in life. Mm. But Jung believed that an excessive That's fixation on the past do. was merely an avoidance tactic used to evade the difficult task of facing up to what needs to be done now. People should know, he wrote, that not only the neurotic, but everyone, naturally prefers never to seek the causes of any inconvenience in himself, but to push them as far away from himself as possible in space and time. Otherwise, he would run the risk of having to make a change for the better, mm, compared bro. with otherwise. People should know that not only the neurotic, but everyone, naturally prefers never to seek the causes of any inconvenience or problem or pains, a lot of the times, in himself. Right, something that you know you need to change. You sort of just don't want to look at it. You you just want to turn a blind eye. You want to turn the other way. Turn the cheek towards your problems. You want to just evade them as long as possible and, and just not think about them and ignore them. You know, and just we'll we'll work out. We'll put them in our muscles, or we'll drink it away, or we'll drug it away. Whatever it is, we'll smoke it away. But to push them as far away from himself as possible in space and time. Otherwise, he would run the risk of having to make a change for the better. This is something that's very crucial for people to know. That's very crucial. Otherwise, he would run the risk of having to make a change for the better. Compared with this odious risk, it seems infinitely more advantageous either to put the blame onto somebody else or, if the fault lies undeniably with oneself, at least to assume that it somehow arose of its own accord in early infancy. <laughs> With these doses of psychological insight, Jung would turn to the first actionable step in his method of treatment, and this was to help his patients face up to what he called the shadow. For as Jung writes, the first yes. requisite of any thorough psychological method is for consciousness to confront its shadow. The shadow is Jung's term for the elements of our character that we deny and force into the unconscious due to shame, insecurity, or censure. It is, in other words, the side of our personality we wish to hide from others as well as from ourselves. There can be no doubt that man is, on the whole, less good than he imagines himself or wants himself to be. Everyone carries a shadow, and the less it is embodied in the individual's conscious life, the blacker and denser it is. Jung believed that facing up to the shadow was crucial in the process of self-change for several reasons. Firstly, we do ourselves no favors by denying the inferior parts of our personality. True. We merely lose control of how and when these traits emerge. If, on the other hand, we acknowledge a character flaw, we can learn how to control its expression and so minimize the damage it does in our life. Or as Jung Ooh. explains, Ooh. Anything conscious can be corrected, but anything that slips away into the unconscious is beyond the reach of correction, and its rank growth, undisturbed, is subject to increasing degeneration. 
Happily, nature sees to it that the unconscious contents will erupt into consciousness sooner or later and create the necessary confusion. But the shadow is not only made up of weakness, Carl rather, Jung, some elements of it are strengths which we repressed in our youth because our peers, family members, or society at large gave us the false impression that these traits were bad. bad. Some Negative. people, for example, repress the ability to express anger or the ability to stand up for themselves. Another benefit of becoming conscious of the shadow, therefore, is that we gain access to life-promoting character traits, or as Jung writes, the shadow is merely somewhat inferior, primitive, unadapted, and awkward, not wholly bad. It even contains qualities which would in a way vitalize and embellish human existence, but convention forbids. Uh. One way to become conscious of the shadow is to observe the weaknesses, flaws, and insecurities of those close to us. For not only do most of us repress similar character traits, but we also- uh, that, dude, That's a task. Why do I want to- I'm, I'm trying to find my own shit. Why do I need to look at other people's shit? Why? Let me just look at my own stuff and deal with my own stuff. I don't want to look at other people's shadows. Here. For not only do most of us repress similar character traits, but we also tend to project elements of our shadow onto other people. I guess it is people. important. If, therefore, yes. we pay attention to which character traits of our friends and family bother us, we may also gain a glimpse of our own shadow. In addition to observing others, another way to bring the shadow into the light of consciousness is to reflect huh? on the motives for our actions. I'm not gonna lie, this guy's talking really fast, bro. This guy's going by quick. Ugh, I probably should have the captions actions we are ashamed of and to be open to self-criticism when it is warranted for his mm. young notes often the only thing that is preventing us from seeing our shadow is the ability is to that? be honest with ourselves huh. with a little self-criticism so one can see through the shadow along with becoming more conscious of the shadow another integral aspect of Jung's method of treatment was helping his patients find a meaning to their lives ah so being honest to yourself confronting your shadow you know being self-aware Seeing the shadow, facing your problems, you know, excuse me, like Jordan B. Peterson has actually said, if you just take one day, right, you, you ask yourself with the hopes of getting an answer, you know, not just mouthing the words, whatever, not just act like just saying it and not actually getting a response. Like you have to ask the question and then respond it yourself. It's like. What incredibly stupid things am I doing? Or what am I doing that is incredibly wrong that I could be, that I could fix and that I should fix? And it's like, that's the type of things that you want to do. It's like that self-awareness. It's that self, um, self-questioning, you know, like questioning yourself. That's very important. For Jung believed that when stuck in a deep depression or consumed by an anxiety disorder, to be cured necessitates discovering a role as one of the actors in the divine drama of life. To understand oh what God. was meant by this, drama we can turn to an encounter actor. Jung had with a chief of the Pueblo tribe in the first half of the 20th century. Jung was discussing with this man the traditions of his tribe when the chief made the following remark. Yes, we are a small tribe, and these Americans, they want to interfere with our religion. They should not do it, because we are the sons of the father, the son. He who goes there, pointing to the son, that is our father. We Nobody must help goes him there. It's hot. to rise over the horizon and to walk over heaven. And we don't do it for ourselves only. We do it for America. We do it for the whole world. Damn. Jung understood that for America. We must help him daily to rise over the horizon and to walk over heaven. Over heaven? You're not going under, you're going over heaven? Or is that like, this is, this is like old writing. It's not that old. And we don't do it for ourselves only. We do it for America. We do it for the whole world. Okay, America. okay. We do it for the whole world. Jung understood that to many in the modern day, this statement would sound crazy and archaic. But as he further notes, the members of this tribe did not suffer like we suffer. Oh yeah, how so? They were not infected by neuroses, anxiety disorders, or depression. They did not fill themselves with pills each day, and they were not debilitated by addictions. Rather, this tribe was composed of highly functioning individuals who saw themselves as fulfilling their duty as an actor in the divine drama of life, and their lives were rich in meaning and purpose. Or as Jung wrote, these people have no problems. They have their daily life, their symbolic life. They get up in the morning with a feeling of their great and divine responsibility. You're a guy. They are the sons of the son, the father, and their daily duty is to help the father over the horizon, not for themselves alone, but for the whole world. Ah. You should see these fellows. They have a natural, fulfilled dignity. Jung contrasts this way of I'm life with- I'm telling you, I'm here. telling you, sometimes, that's what I learned, sometimes it's just better to be irrational, you know? 
it's like it, that's taboo as fuck because you know we love to be rational we love to use reason we love to use so- whatever but some like you come to find out sometimes being irrational is just better there's gonna be times where you need a so- like in, in politics this is gonna be a time where you need a sovereign you need somebody in the government higher up to take complete control and like really use their fucking power to make a decision because otherwise society might crumble you know like sometimes those bad things that we're trying to prevent it's a paradox of life sometimes it's just necessary sometimes it's just better even though we you know since it's so ingrained into who you are you think no that's got to be no being irrational no no that's bad that's like being anti-human that's like being anti-modernism that's like being anti-society anti-science no it's like you have to recognize there's value to be had in these things it's like religion you know i actually have i have like almost like a newfound respect for religion because it's a tool just like science honestly of course science is one where in the fundament the foundations of the tool is not just we're going to explain everything by saying that some god created it of course it's going to be well it's a it's a more <laughs> a complex one it's more is very well built from the ground up it's not just something that is convenient and easy for a human to make up in a story like Oh, there's a guy. There's a guy in a throne up there. He created all of this. How can you not? How could he? You know? How can you say no? Look at all this. I'm. I have. I'm thirsty. Here's a water bottle. Right? There's a well over there. There's some water over there. This world is clearly made for us. It's designed. How can you not see the design? It's like. It's not how that works. Um. But. Uh, sometimes it's just better to be irrational. You know, I kind of wish I believed that. I wish I could believe that fully. Because look, all my anxiety has gone. If I could just believe that I was, my whole entire life, I was working towards helping some, that, that I was the son of the father and that I was helping him get over heaven. And like, if I had that much responsibility and like meaning, well then all of that just disappears, doesn't it? Why do you think none of our ancestors died of stress or anything like that or anxiety i mean they died from being eaten by bears but they didn't die of this shit you know this lady as young notes was a compulsive traveler always running from one place to the next always seeking but never really finding what she was looking for i was amazed when i looked into her eyes wrote young the eyes of a hunted a cornered animal seeking seeking always in the hope of something she is possessed and why is she possessed because she does not live the life that makes sense. Hers is a life utterly, grotesquely banal, with no point in it at all. If she dies today, nothing has happened, nothing has vanished, because she was nothing. Mm. Calm down, Carl. You don't have to disrespect my, you don't have to go that hard. You don't have to come at her like that, man. Come on, dog. Who are you to say what a, what a, what a you know, what no point is. There's not. Tr- There's no. No person could tell you what a point is. If she sees point in what she's doing, then it would be that. But of course, likelihood is, she doesn't see point in it. She doesn't really think about what she's doing. She just kind of does it. She kind of maybe just goes on instinct and is trying to run away from her problems. That's why he describes her as a hunted and cornered animal. But it's like. You can't, you should just ask her to be self-aware of what she's doing. But, see, that is, that is kind of what he's done. He hasn't told her what to do. Something that you definitely can't tell somebody is, tell somebody what to do. You cannot do that. You know, with no point in it at all. If she dies today, nothing has happened. Nothing has vanished. Because she was nothing. This compulsive seeking infects many in the Western world. Some run from one destination to another. Some chase romantic partners. Others are compulsive seekers of money, prestige, fame, or recognition on social media. But whatever the outward form it takes, the underlying motivation is the same. The seeker is trying to run away from the banality of their existence. They are seeking to fill the void of emptiness that comes from living a meaningless life. But as Jung explains, this void cannot be filled with things or even experiences. What fills this void is knowing that we are living in a way that makes a difference, or as he writes concerning the woman he met. But if she could say, I am the daughter, right? What fills this void is knowing that... <clears throat> for all you women, for all you hoes out there looking to have a type of experience, live a type of 
certain type of lifestyle since you feel there's no meaning to your boring fucking life. Um, don't just go after the rich guy. Don't just say that you deserve the man making 100k. There is no answers to be found. What the fuck Learn did I do, man? Find responsibility. They are the sons of the sun. Notes Damn. is a compulsive void of emptiness that comes from living a meaningless life. But as Jung explains, this void cannot be filled with things. So that's very important. That's key. To understand, this shit ain't gonna be filled with things. You know, consumerism ain't gonna be, ain't gonna solve your problems. Okay, consumerism Even is not experience. solving your problems. Consumerism is not that. Buying thing, no. No. It's like, why do we need to do, like, we're causing problems by finding out so much. Because there is a thing there that needs to be filled. Okay, like Nietzsche said, God is dead. And everybody I look around today, they just want to fill that. But it's like, even motherfucker, like, I'm going to go for a religious motherfucker. Because some, like, if you can find meaning in doing something, I'm going to go for some Amish girl. I, like, these motherfuckers just look everywhere, stu like, in dumb places. In really dumb places they look for for to fill these things and it's like it's not even the same thing how to fill the void of religion you're gonna go buy like that never made sense to me you're gonna go look for this why how's that meaning to you come on why why are, why are humans like this why i want i want somebody that's self-aware where are the self-aware people do I even know what self-awareness is? How can I say I'm self-aware? I mean, it should be so easy to say that I'm self-aware. Because it's not like I'm free from that either. I desire meaning. You probably. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it out loud. And I'm not maybe the fully conscious and aware of it. But I, I agree. There's, there's a likelihood. I mean, that's what they say. You know. I mean, like I said, you can't take, you know, science as, you know, the truth. The end all be all. But... There's reason for, for, for why they say that, and I can't deny that at all, you know. I can't deny it. I'd have to have proof that I'm not looking for something to fill voids, you know. I likely I likely am. Maybe that's why I got into philosophy, ever since I questioned God's existence, maybe. This is what fills this void is knowing that we are living in a way that makes a difference. Or as he writes okay, concerning so the woman Okay, so that's the met. only way, is to know but that you're making a say, difference. I am the daughter of the moon. Every night I must help the moon, my mother, over the horizon. Ah, that is something else. Then she lives. Then her life makes sense, and makes sense in all continuity, and for the whole of humanity. That gives peace, when people feel that they are living as actors in the divine drama. That gives the only meaning to human life. Everything else is banal, and you can dismiss it. A career, producing of children, are all Maya compared with that one thing. That your life is meaningful. Jung was not suggesting that we all adopt the Pueblo in mythology. Rather, his point is that many people suffer because their life makes no sense. And the task for those who want to be free of anxiety or depression is to discover this sense. We must, in other words, find a way to justify our existence, so that we, like the Puebloan, can believe that our life is meaningful. For some, this can be accomplished through religion. For others, by contributing in a substantial way to the promotion of values such as justice, freedom, or community while others will find it through the creative act. But for those of us in the modern West, where we lack a dominant mythology, it is up to us, and us alone, to discover how we can play a meaningful role in the divine drama of life. For the few who accomplish this task, a fulfilling life will define their future. For the many who don't, years or decades of pointless suffering and compulsive seeking will be their fate. I am only concerned with the fulfillment of that which is in every individual, wrote Jung. That is the whole problem. That is the problem of the true Pueblo, that I do today everything that is necessary so that my father can rise over the horizon. This content is made possible by... That's powerful. That's good. That's fucking good. Woo! I love that. The meaning of two personalities is like the contact of two chemical substances. If there is any reaction, both are transformed. Woo! That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. I like that. Let me know what you guys think. Finding purpose. Some a common theme. You know. It's like. He, th he says. But it's like. Mm, it, he's seen it. He's observed. If you have meaning. You don't have these problems. You don't suffer as much. 
If you do suffer, it's different forms of suffering. It ain't those, though. Somebody, I'm going to use that. 